tonight. Hope everyone had a good day today. It's good always to be able to close our day by worshiping God. I want to begin tonight by thanking this good congregation for all the kindness that you have extended to my wife and to myself. We've had a wonderful week being with you. We've enjoyed every minute of being in your homes and enjoying our association together. We certainly appreciate your kindness. We're always thankful to be invited to gospel meetings like this. It's always a humbling experience, and I want you to know that I appreciate very much the time that we've had together. It's been good to get to know uh, John and Jennifer just a little bit. Uh, we've uh, appreciated our time with them as well. And I pray and trust that things will go well for you and for John and the work that he is doing here with you all. Uh, and of course, we appreciate uh, the Atkins uh, hospitality. They're not here uh, tonight to hear that, but, uh, but they have just been wonderful and uh, they're just fine folks. And keep them in your prayers as Jim is struggling a little bit and we need to, uh, we need to be thinking about, about him. But, uh, but we just appreciate the, the week, and we've had a great time. It's, uh, Jan was, uh, Janice was mentioning, I think a couple of nights ago, how that this has it's been a long time since we've been in the homes of people so often during a gospel meeting. Like anymore, it used to be that that was a regular occurrence, but anymore, it seems like for the visiting preacher, you're taking out to uh, places to eat more than being in the homes of people people. And, and of course, we appreciate that very, very much when that is the case. But we like being with brethren in their homes. And every night that was the case here, uh, except for with Chuck and Susan. And we know why that was. I was in their homes last time I was here and, and would have been this time if it wasn't uh, for the illness that Chuck was having. So we're just glad he's feeling better. But every other night we've been, to, we've been in the homes of people. And so that's, uh, you're to be commended for that. Uh, it's wonderful to see a congregation so hospitable as you are. Well, pray for us as we'll be leaving in the morning. If you're ever in the Akron area, come check us out, the Brown Street Church of Christ. We would, we would certainly love to see any of you at, uh, at uh, our congregation. This week, as most of you know, we have been looking at biblical fellowship. We spent the entire week, at least uh, Monday through tonight, on this very important subject, biblical fellowship. And we began on Monday, you recall, simply by looking at what biblical fellowship is and what it is not. And then we spent the next three nights looking at the fellowship that we have with God. We began with the Father, then we looked at our fellowship with the Son, and then, of course, last night we looked at our fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Tonight, as we close this series of lessons, we want to emphasize our fellowship with the saints. And let me ask you tonight, do you take your fellowship with your brothers and sisters in Christ seriously? And the fact of the matter is, you ought to. Because the truth is, we need each other in Christ. We need biblical fellowship. We need the fellowship that we have amongst ourselves as God's children. We need that. We need it for our spiritual growth. We, we need it to, to be all that we can be in Christ. And the fact of the matter is, the one who knows that more than anyone else is the devil himself. One of his famous, one of his favorite tactics is to divide us. That's what he wants. He, he, he loves to isolate Christians and then attack. And the way he does that sometimes is by causing some kind of discontentment to creep into the hearts of certain saints. It, it, it may be that the particular saint is, is angry by something that the preacher preached. It, it may be that they're upset with the decision that and the elders made or perhaps someone in the congregation makes them mad, but, but they find themselves disconnected from the local church. And once they become isolated like that, then they're vulnerable to the attacks of the devil. And he knows that. That is indeed where he does everything he can 
to reach that individual because now when that person is disconnected from the local church and, 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 and isolated, when adversity comes into his life or her life, then usually without a support system, they're vulnerable to those attacks of the devil. And so we can see by that how important it is for us to have the fellowship that we have and to appreciate how important it is and to do everything we can to cultivate it. You might remember certain passages like Proverbs 13 at verse 20. It simply says, whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. And the second part of that certainly is important, but I'm interested in the first part of that. Whoever walks with the wise becomes wise. This is why God has arranged for his children once they obey the gospel of Christ. And they're added to the universal church to join themselves to local congregations like this. Because they're strength in numbers. We certainly are better when we are together. And so we want to talk just a little while about fellowship with the saints. The early saints were, of course, devoted to fellowship. We saw as we opened up this series of lessons on this subject, Acts 2 at verse 42. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And you notice the word devoted. They were devoted to fellowship. Strong says that that means to be earnest toward, to persevere, to be constantly diligent, to attend assiduously, or to adhere closely to. Does it sound to you when you think about the early church that they were devoted to fellowship? Does it sound to you that they took that lightly? No, of course not. They understood just how significant it was. And so they were constantly involved in fellowship. Now, let's uh, remind ourselves one more time that, that the biblical fellowship that we're talking about is not social. It is not secular. It, it, it is not fun and games and entertainment and recreation. It, it, it's none of that. It, it is very interesting that that these Christians here, they did associate with each other. It just wasn't called fellowship. I, when I say that, that, that fellowship is not social, it's not Christians just getting together and sharing a common meal, I'm talking about from a biblical standpoint that's never called fellowship. It doesn't mean that that's not important. Like, I would encourage you all to, to associate with each other as often as you possibly can. That's a good thing. We, we see even in this chapter of, of Acts chapter 2 that the early church was engaged in that. At verse 46, it says, And day by day, attending the temple together, that would be fellowship. They would go and they would pray together. But then it says, And breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. That was mere association. And by the way, they found the time to do that. It seems like we're too busy today to, to, to get together as often as we should just to get to know each other and to develop that filial love, that brotherly love that we need very badly to be what God wants us to be. But the point of it is, that's not called fellowship. It's interesting to me that in the ESV, in their footnotes, and I understand that that was just added by man, but it's still interesting to me that, that in their footnotes, as they give passages to reference the fellowship in verse 42, they don't list verse 46 as one of the passages that emphasizes fellowship. You want to see the passages that they do list? Galatians 2 at verse 9 is one of them. And when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me, that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. That's fellowship. They were 
partners in spreading the gospel of Christ. Peter and James, of course, to the Jews and, and Paul and Barnabas to the Gentiles, but they were partners in the preaching of the word of God. That's fellowship. Here's another passage. They, they gave three passages. One, another one is Philippians chapter one and specifically at verse five, but notice it beginning at verse three. He says, I thank my God in, in all my memor remembrance of you. Always and every prayer of mine for you all making uh, my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart for you are all partakers with me of grace both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. That he again there was referring to evangelism. The church at Philippi, as most of you know, contributed to Paul monetarily. That was fellowship. They were involved in fellowship with Paul. They had fruit every time he won someone to Christ. That was fruit not only on his behalf, but Philippians 4 tells us it was on their behalf as well because they were partners in the preaching of the gospel. And so it's interesting that, that the biblical scholars, at least, who, who, who put together the ESV version, they referenced that next to the word fellowship in Acts 2 at verse 42. And then they put this passage as well as a reference. 1 John 1 at verse 3. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Now, we know that fellowship was spiritual, wasn't it? didn't have to do with secular things. It didn't have to do with social things. It didn't have to do with eating common meals and that sort of thing. We have fellowship with the Son. When's the last time you ate a common meal with Jesus? Well, of course we don't do that. We do share a meal with Jesus, though, don't we? You remember in, in 1 Corinthians 10 at verse 16, in reference to the Lord's Supper, the cup of blessing that we bless. Is it not a participation in the blood of Christ, the bread that we break? Is it, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Koinonia, the word that we have said all week long, is the Greek word for fellowship, is translated in this particular verse, participation. It's referring to the Lord's Supper. It's fellowship. Every time you observe the Lord's Supper, you're in fellowship with the Son of God and the taking of communion. And so we, we understand then, as we look at this, the biblical fellowship that we're talking about is not physical, it, it is not carnal, it, it's certainly not secular, it's not social, it is spiritual in nature. But let's look for a little while at the benefits of having fellowship with the saints. I don't have time to talk to you of all of the benefits that we enjoy because of our relationship one with another in Christ. It is something we should never, ever take for granted. It is a joy to be a part of a huge family. Wherever we go in this world, we know that, that we will run into people who are our brothers and sisters in Christ. I think I said this week, if I haven't, I should have. It, it, it's wonderful, and, and, and Mike would attest to this, as gospel preachers, when you go from place to place and hold gospel meetings, sometimes we go into homes, we don't know anybody. We, we go to churches, we don't, we're not familiar with the brethren. A lot of times we go back to congregations like, like here this week, but a lot of times we go to places we've never been before. There's not one awkward moment in those situations because we're with our brethren. We're a part of a huge family. We're all children of God, and they tr treat me always. I I've never, ever been treated in a bad way. They always treat me with love and kindness just the way you had this week. It's the way it always is because we have fellowship. We're partners 
in the gospel of Christ. We're, we're partners with God. We're companions. And, and so it is never awkward. It is always wonderful. There's so many benefits of having this kind of fellowship. Let's look at just a couple of them here tonight. A few of them tonight, I should say. First of all, the encouragement that it offers. Uh, this world is tough, isn't it? It's a dangerous world in which we live. There's problems, there's trials and tribulations. That is the lot of every single one of us. If I were to tell you, if I were to ask you tonight, would, please stand up if you haven't ever had any problems in life. Who would stand up? Nobody. Because that's just life. Job said that man that is born of woman is a few days full of trouble. It seems as if that there are more valleys than peaks in life. That's why we appreciate the peaks so much. There's trouble on every hand. It's just the way it is. In the life of the everyday person, there's bills that have to be paid. There are disobedient children sometimes that try our patience. There are pipes that break and air conditioning units that go out. There are family problems and health problems and financial problems, and that's just life. And guess what? We're not in a biblical sense, but we have fellowship in that regard. We are joint participants in the trials and tribulations of life. It's just the way life is. But one thing never changes. No matter what we're going through, no matter what tragedy will creep into our lives, brethren are always there. We always have each other to encourage one another and to help us through the difficult times of life. Please don't take that for granted. Anybody who has ever had real tough times in life know how brethren seem to always come through and reach out and help and lift us up when we're down. We should appreciate that. No matter where we are, that seems to be the case. We can encourage one another. And there's so many passages that speak of this sort of thing. Two are better than one, the wise man said, because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. The truth is, in Christ, we're never alone. We always have brethren to lift us up. And I know that some, and I talked about it in the very beginning, but in, in some congregations sometimes we fail in this regard, and that's a shame. For the most part, brethren are there when we need them most. It's because of our fellowship that begins with God, remember, and then extends one to another in Christ. And it's wonderful to have that kind of encouragement. Proverbs 27 at verse 17, iron sharpens iron and one man sharpens another. It is wonderful to be challenged by other Christians. That, that helps, rem, helps us to remain strong. And, and we have that in Christ. Not all positive all the time. Sometimes it's challenging, brethren. will challenge us to do better. Let me ask you, do, do, do you enjoy it when you find yourself around those in Christ who you know are a little more spiritual than you are? You ought to appreciate that. And you ought to allow them to rub off on you. you. You ought to look. There's a passage I can't remember. I think it's in the book of Philippians where, where Paul encourages us to follow other examples in Christ. And it's a great exhortation. It's a good practice for you to look around the local church and, and to look for people who can help you. Look for examples that other brethren, if you're a young brother in Christ, look to see the examples of older brothers in Christ and what they're setting and follow their example. Younger sisters, look to the good wives, those who have had experience and who have raised families and you can learn from them. They can sharpen you. And that's just a benefit of fellowship. 
You, you remember, of course, in, in, in one of the most familiar passages in the New Testament, Hebrews chapter 10. Turn your Bibles over there. One of the reasons why we should never forsake the assembly is simply because of the wonderful benefit that we get from it. We, we talk about the, the work of the church being edification, and, and that's right. One of the threefold works of the church. And do you know where we are edified more than any other place? It's when we assemble ourselves together. This is how God builds, builds us up. And so we should never forsake the assembly. And in fact, when we do so, there's some selfishness to that. We're not thinking about our brethren and how we can help and encourage. And that's really what Hebrews chapter 10 says. It is all about, beginning at, at verse 24, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. And then he says, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. What's our responsibility? Encouraging one another. And, and so we need to start to realize not only is this fellowship among saints, not only is it a wonderful, wonderful blessing, it is a responsibility as well. You shouldn't just be sitting back thinking, now, I, I hope my brethren can lift me up when I'm down. I want them to encourage me. You ought to be encouraging your brethren all the time. And one way you can do that is make sure you attend each and every service each and every assembly of the saints because it's an opportunity to provoke others to love and good works. It's a responsibility that we have. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5 at verse 11, therefore encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. Again, a responsibility. But you know what? It's exactly what brethren do. Yes, we do fall short from time to time, and probably we can all do better, and we need to strive to do better. But there is enough of that in almost every local congregation. Brethren truly encouraging one another for us to understand the value of this fellowship that we're talking about this week. It is something that we ought to thank God for all the time. But then there is the rebuke that it offers. Because the truth is, none of us are perfect. None of us have reached the apex of our spirituality where we don't fall short from time to time and, and, and need help. And sometimes we don't realize it. Sometimes we don't see it. Sometimes we can begin to drift away just a little bit, slowly but surely, to where we don't even realize it's happening. And then a brother or sister steps forward to warn us, sometimes to rebuke us. And as we think about the, the idea of encouragement, that's the positive side of helping one another, rebuking, uh, uh, admonishing one another. That, uh, that's kind of the negative side of it, but it's just as helpful, and it's needed. And we need to be willing to, to do that, to understand the value of it. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. And how many times has that happened in real life in local congregations like this? Someone who loves his brother or sister enough to not just sit back and, and ignore the fact that someone has drifted, but to stand up and do something about it, to make a phone call, to send a card, to go to a house and actually talk to someone and, and try to warn them of the direction that they're going. And how many times has it happened that that has caused an individual to repent and come back to the fold? The devil hates when that happens. The devil hates when we love each other. He hates when we recognize our responsibility to help someone who is weak and to encourage them to be stronger, to rebuke them even when that's necessary. He doesn't like that at all. But it's helpful. And we ought to be willing to do our part 
when it comes down to this. Proverbs 27 at verse 6, faithful are the wounds of a friend, profuse are the kisses of an enemy. Oh, you need to be careful about flattery. But when someone comes forward and, and, and they strive to help you, it might hurt. Listen, being rebuked doesn't feel good. Nobody likes to be rebuked. But if the one coming to us is loving and kind, it's helpful. And we need to make sure, by the way, that, that we're demonstrating the kind of love one towards another that we ought to because then that makes the rebuke effective. Like I, I, I've, I've said many times before, maybe I've said it this, this week, my biggest critic is my wife. Like, I think we mentioned at dinner, someone, you ought to see her notes sometimes. And, and every mistake I make from behind this pulpit, it's written down somewhere, her notes. It's not really, but it seems like it. <laughs> like, like, Don, you know, that wasn't a word, you know. <laughs> you know, all that wrong tense and, you know, or what are you talking about? <laughs> but I take it. You know why I take it? Because I know she loves me. I know everything she tells me. If she tells me, Don, that's a sermon, probably you don't need to preach again. <laughs> I know that she's trying to help me. That causes me to li I don't like it, but it causes me to listen. And you get the point of that, don't you? If brethren, now, if you're always mean to others in Christ, if, if you're constantly being a discouragement to others, when you go and do some rebuking, how do you think that's going to come across? When, when you try to correct your brother, but, 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 but you have used harsh words, you have a habit of doing that, and how do you think they're going to take that? Not very well. They don't believe you have their best interests at heart. But when you love each other, and you know you love each other, then when there's rebuking, it's a lot easier to take, isn't it? And that's our responsibility at both ends. We, we have the responsibility to listen to brethren when they come. And, and we, we understand that the wounds, they may hurt, but they're helpful. Because it's coming from a place of love. It's our responsibility not to get mad, not to get defensive, but to listen and try to do better. It's also our responsibility to go to those who need to be rebuked. I, I know that's not pleasant. I, I know there's some of us, we all have different personalities. There's some people who say someone may sit against them and their attitude is, well, I, you know, I'm just going to kind of ignore that. I, I don't really like controversy and so... You know, let's, well, I just let it go. Well, if that person has sinned against you and you just let it go, what's going to happen to that person? They may never repent. And then they're going to be lost. What is more important? You being a little uncomfortable and going to your brother or sister and rebuking them when they need to be rebuked, warning them of the error of their way and saving a soul covering a multitude of sins, as the passage in James said, or just doing what makes you feel good. We have a responsibility to learn how to rebuke and to learn how to be rebuked. And the fact of the matter is many brethren have learned those lessons, and it's helpful, and it's a benefit of the fellowship that we have. It's like a safety net to keep us from falling away for good. And here's another benefit maybe that you don't think of very often. You see the power of God at work in others. It's a great joy of our fellowship. I love to see converts. When, when they simply grow in Christ, you know where they began and, and, and you know how far they have come. And, and they demonstrate that they're strong in the faith and, and that they're willing to stand up for what is right. They abhor what is evil. You just see how far they have come. That is very edifying, isn't it? It's an encouragement. We see the power of the word of God. And, and there are many times when that is expressed. Paul, you remember, with regard to the brethren at Thessalonica, he said, we ought always to give thanks to God for you 
Uh, brothers, as is right, because your faith is growing abundantly and the love of every one of you for one another is increasing. Paul was edified by that. He loved to see that. But you just think about the history of the church in Thessalonica. You remember that Paul went in there to preach the gospel for three Sabbath days. He preached the gospel to them, and then he was forced out of town. And so what was left behind was a young church filled with babes in Christ. And as Paul went away, he always wondered. He was always anxious about what was going on with them. Have has Satan gotten his way with them? Do they still even exist? Do they love me like they did when I left? What's the state of that congregation? And when he heard that they were doing great, that, that, that they were strong and, and growing in the faith and that their faith was being spread abroad so that other people heard about him, he was filled with zeal. He was at Corinth at the time. You might remember the Bible history there. That, that when he got a report about that, it's like he was on fire once again and began to boldly preach the gospel because that was edifying to him. We see that sort of thing in Scripture. Tur turn your Bibles over to 3 John just for a moment. In, in, in 3 John, a, a, a couple of verses here. This is just one chapter, of course. 3 John. At verse 1, 3 John and verse 1, the record says, The elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Now watch. Beloved, I pray that all may go well with you and that you may be in good health as it goes well with your soul. Why? Because he cared about his brother. They had fellowship. But look at verse 3. For I rejoice greatly when the brothers came and testified your truth, as indeed you are walking in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Is that the way you feel about your brothers? You, you hear of someone doing great in the Lord. Does that fire you up? Does that edify you? Can you say, I have no greater joy than that? It should. It should cause all, all of us to rejoice. And once again, it's a reminder to ourselves. If the gospel, if, if it's so powerful, it can change the lives of others like that, it can change our lives too. It's a great benefit of this fellowship we're talking about. To see the power of God at work in other people. And then one more thing, very quickly. We benefit by the prayers of of the saints. Do you not believe in the power of prayer? I'm quite sure all of you do. We probably don't take advantage of prayer like we ought to. It's one of the greatest privileges and blessings that we have. But we understand that it's powerful, don't we? And how powerful is it that whenever we're down, whenever we're in need, we literally have hundreds of brethren, sometimes all over the country, praying for us. That's a benefit of this fellowship that we're talking about. You, you, you know who understood the, the, the power of that? Paul did. There, the, the, there's a passage in 2 Corinthians that I just love. T turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And Paul begins here to describe a situation that he was going through. And let me just tell you now that we don't know exactly what Paul is talking about. We don't know what he's referring to, that is, on this occasion. But we know that, that, that he was in a life-threatening situation and God delivered him. Verse 8 of, of 2 Corinthians chapter 1, it reads like this. For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. Now, we, we can stop and think of Paul's time in Asia, and we, we can maybe understand, well, maybe it's referring to this or that, but we can't be sure what event that he was referring to. But he says, For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. 
Like Paul is referring to a real life situation in his life. Whatever time, wherever he was, we know he was in Asia, but whatever the situation was, his back was up against the wall. He believed with all of his heart he was going to die. That, that was how desperate the situation was. He says in verse 9, indeed, we felt like we had received the sentence of death. But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. Now watch. He delivered us from such a deadly per uh, peril. And, and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. Isn't that powerful? Like You ought to underscore that verse in your Bible. Here is Paul saying, we were in a mess. We thought we were going to die. We thought we had the sentence of death. And God delivered us. And because of that, we believe that he will deliver us now. And he will deliver us tomorrow. That was the faith and the encouragement that Paul had from that experience. But he says something else in this text that is interesting. If you notice at verse 11, he goes on to say this to the Corinthians. You also must help us by prayer. I still like other, uh, I don't think the ESV is very good there. The King James and, and others like it say, you also helping together in prayer. Even the American Standard uses that kind of language. Here is Paul saying, man, we were in trouble. It didn't look like we were going to survive, but God delivered us, and you helped by praying for us. And that's the power of prayer, and we have it every day. When we're down, brethren can pray for us, and they often do. We've, we've uttered many prayers this very week on behalf of, of those who, who are sick at this congregation. And every congregation is the same. It is a great benefit. It, it is a wonderful blessing. It should be edifying to all of us that when we're down, we have Christians who have the ability and the willingness to pray for us. And God hears our petitions. We know that. And so what a great benefit of the fellowship that we have with saints. We could put many more things on the screen. It's just a sample. Thank God that we have fellowship, not only with God, not only with the Father, and the Son, the Holy Spirit, but with each other. Let's cultivate it. Let's appreciate it. Let's try to make it stronger and stronger all the time because it is a wonderful benefit of being a child of God. Now, before we close, we must look at the limit of our fellowship with the saints. And I must say to you that I don't really like closing this uh, lesson uh, on a negative note or what might be deemed as being negative. But as we have seen, sometimes uh, uh, admonition can be just as valuable as an excitation. And one of the things that I would admonish you to do is never ever to have fellowship with anything or anyone that God would not. Is there a limit to our fellowship? Yes. There's no doubt about that. In Ephesians chapter 5 and at verse 11, it says, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. Like, we have to take that passage very seriously. It indeed limits our fellowship. We shouldn't have an open-ended fellowship where we're fellowshipping everybody who claims to be a Christian and every person who might be in the body of Christ, regardless of what they're doing, how they're living, how they're behaving. That shouldn't be our attitude. God limits us in our fellowship. Remember, as we said in the very beginning, our fellowship with each other is only an extension of the fellowship we have with God. And because of that, Whoever God will not fellowship, you should not fellowship. Whoever God will fellowship, then we should fellowship. And, and so we, we need to understand, yes, it, it, it is limited, but we need to understand there's a reason. Why is it that God limits his fellowship? Because he's light. We saw it in the very beginning, didn't we? 
God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. God cannot fellowship sin ever. And since he will not, we should not. We, we have looked already this, this week. The word fellowship, uh, again, koinonia is the word. This is the, the, the verb form. Remember we said it was a noun? This is the verb form. It means to share with others. In Ephesians 5 at verse 11, it's it just a part of that family of words, but it has the prefix soon to it, which means with or together by association. So now we see, when you put that together, exactly what Paul is saying. The Greek word there means to share with by association. What is Paul saying? Don't do that. There's certain things you should not share in, ever. There's certain things, there's certain ones that you should not associate with. Who are they? Those who are in darkness. Whether it's moral, whether it's doctrinal, those who are in darkness, we should never have fellowship with. He didn't say, just, you, you have, don't have a whole lot of fellowship with those in darkness. He said, have no fellowship with those in darkness. We, we, we live in a religious world today where, where people think that we ought to be fellowshipping everybody and, and everything. We have brethren now even saying that we should extend the right hand of fellowship even to those in denominational churches. It, it, it's really amazing. Uh, this uh, one one of the men who were was involved in this going way back was Leroy Gary. He wrote this book, Our Heritage of Unity and Fellowship. It was a huge book. In chapter forty, he talked about our brothers and denominations. That was the title of chapter forty. Here's an excerpt of it. He said, "My father begot, and my mother gave birth to eight children." That made the eight of us brothers and sisters. I was next to the last to be born. When the baby of the family came along six years after I was born, no one asked if I would receive him into the family. I was not consulted. I had nothing to do with his becoming my brother. I was stuck with him. We were brothers not because we approved of each other, but because we had the same parents. Now remember the book. Remember the chapter, and you kind of know where he's going with this. He continues to say, so it is in Christ. We can accept each other as fellows in Christ when we may not yet choose to be close friends. I may even believe that you are an heir on some matters, but that does not negate the fact of brotherhood and fellowship. We are stuck with each other but our mutual love for Christ should constrain us to receive one another even as Christ has received you. What is he doing? He is encouraging an open-ended fellowship with anybody who has ever been baptized into Christ, no matter how they're living, no matter where they are religiously, even if they leave the truth and go off into air, you may not agree with them. Nevertheless, he's your brother. You have no choice about that. He is born into the family. You must accept him. Where he makes two critical mistakes in these words that we just read. Number one, he equates the idea of brotherhood and fellowship. Did you see that? He ties them at, at, together with, with, with the word and. Listen, everyone knows I don't have a choice physically or spiritually who my brother is. Uh, he's right about that. In a biological family, we don't have any say about that. And the truth of the matter is we don't have anything to say with who our spiritual brother is either. What we do have a say in is who we fellowship with. Who we extend the right hand of fellowship to. That is our choice. He makes it sound as if they're one, and we don't have a choice of either one of those things. Yes, we do. 
Well, how do we decide? We don't have to make any decisions. God's already made the decision. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. And that's our choice, either to listen to God or not. The second critical mistake he makes, and he hopes we don't notice it here, he says, receive one another even as Christ has received you. The problem is Christ does not receive an individual who leaves the truth and goes into air, who goes into a denominational church. That person is not received by Christ. He wants you to think, oh yeah, just receive him. He's your brother. And Christ receives him. Prove that by the Bible. He couldn't. Remember, God is light. In him is no darkness at all. That's true about the sun as well, is it not? Jesus doesn't receive a person who goes off into air. Second John ver, uh, chapter 1 at verse 9. Everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. Listen, if anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting. For whoever greets him takes part in his wicked works. Takes part. What's fellowship? Partners with. You want to be a partner with sin? The Bible is warning you about that. Someone not abiding in the doctrine of Christ, he has not God. That means he's not in fellowship with God. He may be a child of God. Maybe he was baptized into Christ at some point, but when he leaves the faith, he loses his fellowship with God. Now the Holy Spirit through John is telling us, don't have fellowship in him or her. And someone goes off into air. That's when the fellowship should start. The fact of the matter is, even if we don't have the courage to do that, it's not going to help that person. That person who doesn't abide in the doctrine of Christ has not God, no matter what we do. Why would we encourage that sort of thing? And by the way, another limit of our fellowship, and I don't have time to talk about it in any kind of detail, but that's doctrinally. What about morally? Should we extend the right hand of fellowship to brethren who are living in sin? Of course not. Just read, again, this, I have a whole sermon on this, and almost every preacher does, but you just read 1 Corinthians chapter 5. That's the moral part of it. We can't extend fellowship to brethren when they're in sin. The church at Corinth, they took pride in that. They, 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 they had a, a member who was involved in, in fornication, so such fornication that even the Gentiles looked, looked down upon it. And all they can do is nothing. Like they were happy about it. And Paul said, you need to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. And have no association. Don't eat with that person. And listen to me. It doesn't matter who that brother or sister is. Anyone in Christ who you call a brother, who goes off into sin, that's when the fellowship should stop. It's my son. Well, show me in the Bible where God makes a difference. It's my favorite cousin. Show me in the Bible where God makes a difference. The only relationships that, that, that we can maintain when a person goes off into sin is a relationship where we have a duty before God to perform a particular aspect of that relationship, like a marriage. No, my wife can't leave me because I become unfaithful. But I can give you Bible reasons for that. If you can't give a Bible reason of why you should continue to fellowship someone who is in sin, even if it's a family member, then you better do what the Bible tells you to do. I'm not going to do it. I, I just not, I've had brethren tell me, I, I'm not going to do that. But no matter what you do, that's between you and God. You're going to have to answer to God. One thing you know, that loved one who is in sin, that fellowship with God, that vertical fellowship has already stopped. What you should do 
is what's in the best interest of that person to help restore that fellowship with God. And my guess is doing what God tells you to do is probably the best course of action. But we can, again, talk about that in detail on another occasion. Our fellowship with the saints is limited. And let's make sure we understand that. But let's rejoice in the fellowship that we have, the relationship, the companionship, the partnership that we have in Christ. It's a wonderful thing. And as I've said, we need to cultivate it. We need to grow it. We need to make it stronger and stronger. It's in our best interest and the best interest of our brethren. I hope that we'll understand that. Are you subject to the invitation of Christ? Maybe you haven't obeyed the gospel. Maybe you want some of this fellowship that we've been talking about all this week. If you're in sin, remember, you don't have any fellowship with God. You're not in fellowship with the saints. But you can turn that around this very night. You can obey the gospel. Mark chapter 16, at verse 16, Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Aren't you glad God made it so easy? Like, it's a lot harder to remain faithful. But becoming a child of God, God made that easy on purpose. Remember, he wanted it to be a matter of faith. That it might be by grace so that it may be sure to all the seed. He made salvation accessible to everyone, in other words, including you. You want to be saved, just obey the gospel. Romans 1 at verse 16 is the power of God under salvation. You can believe, if you believe in Jesus, you can be baptized tonight. Your sins will be washed away by his blood, and you can begin having fellowship with God, with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and with all of his children. It's a wonderful thing. I hope that you'll make that happen. Come forward as we together.